So the news has just come through of the 2011 Nobel Prize for Physics. Uh, the Nobel Prize has just gone to three astronomers, uh, Rees, Perlmutter and Schmidt, um, who between them get the whole prize. And I think the way it splits up is Perlmutter gets half of it and Rees and Schmidt get a quarter each. Actually, it turns out one of these three is a mate of mine. Brian Schmidt and I were graduate students together many years ago. In fact, he was, you know, a year or so below me in graduate school. So little Brian has now won the Nobel Prize, has shot past me to glory, and clearly I've, you know, not been doing the right things in my career. Uh, but I'm very pleased for him. He's one of the nicest guys I know, so I'm delighted that he got the prize. Is everyone in the building talking about this today? Have you bumped into people in the coffee room and they're all saying, what do you think? Um, I, I want to talk about it, but it seems like a lot of people haven't been. Uh, I came into the tea room and, and told all the grad students, and they didn't seem to care very much, but um, maybe... <laughs> Maybe it was just too early in the morning. They've won the prize for very carefully measuring the brightness of a, a handful of, of little dots and learning that they're not as bright as they expected them to be. And this just has very fundamental implications for uh, measuring the, the fate of our universe. Brian's a very interesting guy. Uh, he actually he lives in Australia now. Uh, he has many talents, one of which is, for example, he, he runs his own vineyard. So he actually makes his own wine. Um, which I'm told is very good. I've yet to actually taste it, but I'm told it's extremely good. And in fact, Brian and I have a bet, because I bet a number of years ago that this result was wrong. And so I have a, be a bet of a crate of his wine from his vineyard uh, against a really good bottle of malt whiskey um, that his results were going to go away. And I think now he's won the Nobel Prize and I'm going to have to pay him, to be honest. So the science that they've been doing is that these guys have been studying a particular type of supernova, a thing called a Type 1A supernova, um, Essentially, it's just a particular kind of, so supernovae are just exploding stars, stars at the end of their lives. And this particular designation refers to a particular kind of supernova, um, which has a rather unusual property, which is that they're all the same. You know, it's quite unusual in astronomy to have things which are all the same. You know, most types of supernovae, for example, some of them are brighter, some of them are fainter. The interesting thing about this type of supernova is that when you see one, you've seen them all. So actually, they all seem to blow up in exactly the same way. They're kind of dull because, you, as I said, if you've seen one, you've seen them all. But, but actually, that's also what makes them exciting because one of the things we struggle with in astronomy is things which are, are just kind of a standard, right? Things that we can actually compare to one another. So what's known in astronomy as standard candles. They're all the same brightness. If you have something that is a standard candle, it means you know what its intrinsic luminosity, its intrinsic brightness is. Because when we make observations of objects in the universe, sometimes if we don't know how far away they are, we don't know if we're looking at uh, you know, a bright searchlight very far away or a little glowworm right next door. But if we know the intrinsic luminosity, if we know that what we're looking at is a 100 watt bulb, um, then we can fold that into how far away that object is based on how, it, how bright it appears to be. But what's thought to happen is it's thought these are binary stars, so you've got two stars in orbit around another. One of them's a white dwarf. Now, a white dwarf is the end product of a, me you know, a medium-class star like our sun. At the end of its life, it puffs off its outer layers, collapses, but can't collapse all the way because of something called electron degeneracy pressure holding it up. So this white dwarf stays there for a while. And the other is just a normal star. And during the course of its lifetime, this normal star is losing some of its material onto the white dwarf. Now, the thing about white dwarfs is that they have a maximum mass at which they're stable. Called the Chandrasekhar limit. And that's 1.4 times the mass of our sun. And so as long as it's less than that, it'll just sit there as a white dwarf. And this other star will dribble more and more and more stuff on it until eventually it'll dribble that little bit too much on. That'll tip it over this edge. And at that limit, this is an unsustainable system, and it triggers an enormous thermonuclear reaction and causes this star to explode. And that's why we think they're all more or less the same, because actually it's always at this same mass where these things go unstable, so it's not like there are different masses of white dwarf exploding. It's just when they tip over this magic mass called the Chandrasekhar mass um, that they all blow up as supernovae, so they're all the same. And these things can be as bright as an entire galaxy for a, f a couple of weeks. And because they've come out of this sort of standard uh, origin process, this is why they're very good candidates to be standard candles. The supernova physics, although it's interesting, is not the thing they got the prize for. The thing they got the prize for is using them as these standard candles, using them as a way to sort of measure the entire universe. And because they're so bright, we can see them at enormous distances away. We can see them right across the universe, which means we really can use them to probe the properties of the universe as a whole. 
they found that the ones in the distant universe were slightly dimmer than expected given their distance. And what this is telling them, what this is telling us, is that something, the universe itself, has expanded more than we think it, ha it should have. This was surprising because actually cosmologists before this thought that the universe was de-accelerating, going slower. Because if you can imagine the universe is expanding, which you know that from Hubble in the 1930s, that the, uh, uh, the mass would push stuff and make it go slower, but they found it was accelerating, which was completely unexpected. The genius of it was that it's a very, it was a very amb ambitious project to do. I mean, uh, it involved optical telescopes. By the way, this is the first Nobel Prize ever that used optical telescopes in astronomy. There's been ones for radio, but never for optical. The challenge of actually making these observations and gathering enough supernova to, to make the measurements that you need to is quite a difficult one. Um, because supernova are rare, uh, particularly type 1a supernova, which, which is what's needed for this project. The genius behind it was that they used the telescopes in a way that was novel, that they went and they, they searched for these, these stars blowing up. And if you, you know, 20 years ago when they started this kind of thing, if you told the telescope allocation committee, I want to uh, take pictures of, of galaxies and then retake pictures of galaxies to find supernova in, uh, in the distant universe, they would have thought you were, you were crazy. And they, I think they did have a hard time getting telescope time to do this. What these projects did was put together an industrial supernova factory, in, in a sense. So they got telescope time, they had big enough cameras that they could survey large patches of sky around new moon when the sky's dark, and then go back and revisit those same patches three weeks later. And then simply by blinking the two images together, you look for a little tiny change, a little dot coming up, uh, perhaps associated with galaxy, which is going to be that supernova. And because you're surveying such a large patch of sky, um, you, statistics tell you that you will find some supernova. You don't know exactly where they will be, but you will get a sample. And those samples then you take away to other telescopes and you follow them up because what you want to do the important thing for supernova as a standard candle is to catch them at their peak brightness. When these guys first started finding the results in the 1990s, this was a complete game changer. You know, this was not what anyone was expecting. Everyone was expecting that actually gravity was going to be slowing down the expansion of the universe, and therefore probably you know, that they should be measuring a deceleration effect. And they started measuring this acceleration effect, which has kind of overturned the, almost our complete understanding of cosmology and has had to, led us to worrying about things called cosmological constant and dark energy and all the things that are now going into modern cosmology that seem to be leading to this accelerating expansion of the universe. But this was really the, the observational result that set that whole ball rolling. Brian's going to be a busy man today. I suspect he's going to, I haven't yet bothered to try and put a call through to him because I think he's going to have plenty of people on the phone to him today. Yeah. When are you going to contact him about this whiskey then? I think it's, I'll, I'll wait a few weeks. <laughs>